There have been at least five mass extinctions over the last 500 million years, and this last week we learned a little bit more about two of those mass extinctions. We start 252 million years ago with the Great Dying. The Great Dying actually marks the moment we go from the Permian period into the Triassic, and it lives up to its name as it's thought to be the most severe of the mass extinctions. Massive volcanic activity from the Siberian traps is thought to be the main culprit that led to this extinction event, but this paper wasn't looking at the extinction itself. Instead, it was focusing on the recovery. A lot of research has already been done on the extinction and the recovery of the marine ecosystems, but this study actually was looking at the terrestrial ecosystem, so how life on land recovered from the Great Dying. They focused on fossil sites across northern China that captured the first 5 million years after the Great Dying. And they didn't just focus on the actual fossils, but they looked at ichnofossils, so sometimes called trace fossils, things like fossilized burrows, fossilized footprints, other things that show activity. Clues from the fossil sites that captured that immediate time after the extinction, the first million years or so, it's about what you would expect. Really harsh environments, monospecific communities, meaning it was pretty much just dominated by one species. There wasn't much biodiversity across these sites. And the life that did make it through tended to be much smaller, a type of evolutionary dwarfism that can follow these mass extinctions. But that didn't seem to last nearly as long as paleontologists had previously expected. By just 249 million years ago, so 3 million years after the Great Dying, the sedimentary rock told a much different story. Not only were there fossils of medium-sized carnivores suggesting a much more complex food web, but there was a dramatic increase in biodiversity revealed through the fossilized animal burrows, different forms of plant stems, and the traces in the sediment that the roots had left behind. The team's finds revealed that some ecosystems did seem to bounce back much quicker than we expected after the Great Dying, but it's worth mentioning these ecosystems they were looking at places near wetlands, floodplains, areas along rivers, so it's very possible that these places near the water acted as a refuge and kind of eventually allowed populations to spread back out again. So they may have been looking at locations that were the best suited for life, or at least much better than surrounding locations. The second paper was also looking at the recovery of life after a mass extinction, but this one a much more familiar mass extinction, the one that wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs around 66 million years ago. As we all know, dinosaurs were huge. So when we think about how large animals like elephants can affect an ecosystem and apply that logic to giants like sauropods, it's pretty safe to assume they were having a large impact on the environment around them as well. A post-asteroid planet where the large animals are suddenly gone is likely going to have a lot of ecosystems that are out of balance, one of those being forests. Without larger animals moving around knocking those forests back, they're going to grow back thicker and thicker. We have a pretty good example of this recently. We lose the mammoths. Mammoths go extinct. They are massive elephant-like animals moving across the Arctic, knocking down lots of vegetation and trees as their herds move. Once they go extinct, the ecosystem greatly changes, and today it's tundra, lots of trees. A post-asteroid planet without those large animals likely had really thick canopies because the forest would be growing back so much thicker than normal without large animals to knock them back. And those thicker canopies would lead to darker forest floors. But after mass extinctions, the planet tends to figure itself out. It, their a balance comes back into effect over time. It's long been hypothesized that as light on the forest floor got more scarce, larger seeds became more common as they provided an advantage and gave them a head start on their competition. In a world with a sudden loss of all of those large animals, this natural selection would have been amplified, and that is what this paper looked at. They created a model to test this hypothesis. The model strongly supported the hypothesis, showing that once the size of the animals went through that dramatic decrease, the animal size, a recovery happened. And along with the animal size, the seeds were getting larger too. That eventually levels off, like I said, the planet kind of gets itself back into balance. But now I want to point your eyes to this right here, this little break in the graph. We jump forward much closer to the modern day. That dramatic decrease in the size of herbivores over the last 50,000 years is why some scientists argue that we are actually in the midst of the next mass extinction. As our species has spread out of Africa, large animal species have vanished, not all at once, 
but staggered over time. I'm gonna read this word for word from the paper because I think it's pretty powerful to really see how different things are today than even just 12,000 years ago when people were living in South America. Over the last 50,000 years, there has been another drastic decrease in mean body size that rivals that of the extinction of the dinosaurs. For instance, the mean size of animals greater than 10 kilograms throughout South America dropped from 843 to 81 kilograms, with similar trends across the planet. A couple of Florida fossil hunters were diving and looking for fossils along the Steinhatchee River when they saw some ancient horse teeth emerging from the sediment. Not long after, they found a horse hoof core. These finds alone would be enough to draw interest as horses in the Americas went extinct alongside the mammoths within the last 10,000 years. So as someone who likes looking through rivers and looking at sandbars for ancient teeth, anytime you find an extinct animal, that bone is exciting. However, next to those horse fossils, they actually found found the skull of a taper. The close proximity that they found these fossils in made them realize they might have came across something unique, so they got the Florida Museum involved right away. And now, nearly three years later, a paper has been published showing just how important of a find they made that day. On our planet, the environment, it changes over time. Where you are sitting now did not look the same it does today. 500,000 years ago, and where they were hunting for fossils on their property 500,000 years ago, it seems like that must have been a sinkhole. The sinkhole was a death trap for many animals before it eventually filled all the way with sediment and then hundreds of thousands of years continued on before that land, it again changed and now a river is cutting through that area, exposing the ancient animals that were trapped in that sinkhole long ago. And the time period that this sinkhole dates to around 500,000 years ago just happens to be a period where we are missing a lot of information from in the fossil record. Some areas, some time periods, they're really well studied. We have lots of evidence from that time. Some are much less studied, so that's what they're working with here, which makes all 552 fossils recovered really important. 75% of those fossils came from an extinct species of horse, suggesting that this area was likely an open grassland at the time as opposed to a forest. We'd expect to find more things like mastodon remains. And that taper skull, it wasn't out of place. It's well known that tapers were much more widespread during the Pleistocene when ancient humans were living in the Americas. A taper in Florida wasn't uncommon. However, there were traits with that skull that suggested it might be a previously unknown species. And then my favorite were the remains of giant armadillos. This is a great example of a transitional species where we get to see the evolution of a species over time. The more ancient giant armadillos, they get to around 150 pounds. And then as we see more and more recent ones in the fossil record, they tend to get larger. But then there's that gap in the fossil record. After that gap, those giant armadillos are considered a new species because they are so much larger than before. They get up to around 450 pounds. So almost a 500 pound armadillo that's larger than a black bear. But anyways, because these fossils do come from that time period in between, they were able to try to better understand the evolution of this body size. What they saw is that the fossils, they seem to be much larger, so they show that the body size got large pretty quick. However, the actual traits of the bones, they don't have those really specialized traits that we see later on, which suggests that the body size got larger first, and then some of those more derived, those more specialized traits followed. Shout out to the Florida fossil hunters, Robert and Joseph. They were on their own property diving in muddy waters. And those muddy waters, it's very helpful to know the property you're on. You've got alligators out there. It's dangerous stuff. So they were out there looking around and they made the right call and got the museum involved when they realized they may have found something special worth really bringing more eyes onto the scene. All right, for some good news, 2024 YR4. If you're not sure what that is, it's that asteroid you've been hearing about. Earlier in the week, it was deemed to have a one in 32 chance of colliding with our planet. That has been wiped away. It's now less than one in 1000, meaning it's no longer really seen as a threat. So 
there's some good news and it kind of fits the topic of this video, which was unintentionally a lot of talk about extinction. In the comments, let me know how the audio sounds right now. My Rove microphone that I was using in the first video, it just happened to break right after that video. I really don't like how my other microphone has been sounding inside. It's just like I'm recording in a dungeon. It's the absolute worst environment to record a YouTube video in. That, that was an exaggeration. As always, everybody on Patreon, I kind of talked about some good news this week on there, um, but thank you. And thank you for the people who have helped out on Venmo as well. It has made a lot of differences over these last few months. Life has been crazy. We'll see what's gonna happen. I may be teaching next year. I may be doing something else. I don't know. All I know is I'm very thankful for this, this support system that has grown around my science content over the last few years. So, um, Thanks for being here.